In September of 2017, OSHA, or Occupational Safety and Health Administration, started enforcing exposure standards for respirable crystal and silica in the workplace. The purpose of this video is to explain what respirable crystal and silica is and to update the OSHA standard and potential new developments to the ruling, as well as to explore what each contractor company needs to do to protect their employees and business. Before we discuss respirable crystal and silica, we must first understand where crystal and silica can be found. Crystal and silica is a common mineral found in the Earth's crust. Materials like sand, stone, concrete, and mortar contain crystal and silica. It is also used to make products such as glass, ceramic tile, pottery, ceramics, bricks, thinset, grout, and artificial or composite stones. Just think about how many of these products contain crystal and silica that you work with every day. For our purposes, respirable crystal and silica is created when cutting, sawing, grinding, drilling, mixing, and or crushing stone, rock, and concrete, brick, block, tile, or mortar. It's common for people working in the tile trade and other construction trades to be exposed to, and unless they implement safe workplace practices, could potentially inhale respirable crystalline silica particles, making them at an increased risk of developing serious silica-related diseases, including silicosis. For many years, construction workers were exposed to asbestos on jobs, but once the long-term effects were recognized, OSHA stepped in and mandated certain safety requirements when working with asbestos. Now, the same is true for crystal and silica. Based on these potential diseases and other long-term effects, OSHA decided to take steps to protect construction workers in the field. Per OSHA, employers are to limit worker exposures to respirable crystal and silica and to take other steps to protect workers. The employer can either use a control method laid out in Table 1 of the construction standard, or they can measure workers' exposure to silica and independently decide which dust controls work best to limit exposures in their workplaces. Even though workers or employees aren't responsible to put these controls into place, it's important for everyone who works on the job to understand the requirements to reduce exposure. So let's take a closer look at Table 1. The table lists tasks commonly associated with respirable crystal and silica dust exposure. For each task in Table 1, there are engineering controls or work practices that are implemented to prevent exceeding the permissible exposure limit, known as PEL, to respirable crystal and silica. In addition to the engineering controls and work practices, Table 1 also states what, if any, respiratory protection is required. The assigned protection factor, or APF level, for respiratory protection that a respirator is expected to meet is determined by the task being performed and the amount of time a worker is performing the task during their shift. There are only a handful of tasks that require respiratory protection if workers are only performing them for four hours or less during a shift. Most of the control methods in Table 1 involve using tools and equipment with integrated water delivery systems that continuously feeds the water to the work surface in order to keep dust down or to use tools equipped with shrouds and dust collection systems connected to an OSHA-approved high-efficiency particulate air, or known as a HEPA-filtered vacuum, to capture silica dust. The biggest benefit of following Table 1 is that a company won't be required to establish a scheduled air monitoring program or track down objective data to prove that the alternative control methods are reducing workers' exposure limits below the PEL. This regulation does not apply to mixing, pouring, and the installation of mortars or grouts, self-leveling underlayments, patching, or skim-coating compounds if the product does not contain silica. The key concerns of this standard are built on mixing and grinding, drilling, 
demoing, cutting, and cleaning up of concrete or cement-based products. For example, when cleaning up after tasks that could produce silica dust, it is important that employers limit exposure to workers. Dry sweeping or brushing must be avoided in areas covered by the standard. Use a HEPA-filtered vacuum or wet sweeping to clean up debris. While following Table 1 is the easiest for a contractor to get their own in-house program up and running, there are a couple of other options to determine exposure criteria. An employer may decide to measure the worker's actual daily exposure to silica. There are independent test companies that the employer can work with to determine actual exposure of workers on the job. Another option is that many manufacturers are testing their products to determine how much silica exposure a worker could be exposed to on their product over a regular workday. If a manufacturer is stating that any of their products are below the PEL, then it is up to the contractor or employer to get that documentation and retain it in their own records. Don't just take what someone states as fact. If an OSHA inspector shows up on a job, and you don't have the documentation showing the actual exposure, your company could be fined. The tile contractor should have controls in place to reduce exposure, but they must also have a written exposure control plan and make it available to all of their employees. The written plan should contain the following. A description of all tasks that involve exposure to respirable crystalline silica, Details on the engineering control methods and the work practices and respiratory protection required for each task where they could be exposed to respirable silica, including all the items in Table 1. Housekeeping practices to be used to limit exposure. Methods used to restrict access to work areas to limit the number of employees from being exposed to silica dust, which would include potential exposure from other trades on the job. This exposure control plan must be on the job and available if an OSHA inspector asks to see it. And all workers on the job site for the company must follow the exposure control plan. If OSHA is on the job, they see you not following control measures. Even if the book is on site, they could find you and your company anyways. With two years of field experience to monitor as to the effectiveness of the ruling, in 2019, OSHA announced plans to reopen the ruling, primarily focused on possible changes or modifications to Table 1. This process could take some time, but could include submittals with new categories, engineering controls, and PPE requirements. An example in our trade could include, with data to support this, mixing mortar with a 300 RPM drill equipped with a mixing blade, adding water before the powder, and without PPE if under four hours a day. Another possible modification to Table 1 could include proposing new engineering control requirements for tasks already on Table 1, but which could change the PPE requirements. An example here could include air filtration or water flow rates set above the current thresholds that could perhaps now have PPE requirements that could be less restrictive. Some tasks are currently limited to outdoor use only. With data from indoor operations, it may be possible now to show that operations conducted indoors or in enclosed areas are also below the action level of the rule for certain tasks. Beyond adding tasks to Table 1, Companies can also use this opportunity to clarify issues that they identified through efforts to implement the rule. For example, some companies have raised the question of how to differentiate between a grinder and a saw, especially when the same piece of equipment can be used in both capacities. Grinders and saws are currently treated differently on Table 1. While presumably the difference lies in whether a saw blade or grinding wheel is attached, with Table 1 possibly being revised, that can be clarified by OSHA with no ambiguity for the OSHA inspector or the installation company. Lastly, while your company has done their due diligence to determine what controls are needed and to put together an exposure control plan, there are other measures that your company needs to put in place. 
For example, your company should be training employees in safety meetings about potential exposure risks, such as they do with lead. Your company must also keep accurate records per the OSHA standard, and your company must also designate a competent person on each job site to implement the exposure control plan. Remember, a competent person is an employee who is able to recognize hazards such as those in your company's plan and perform inspections. They are also able to determine how to reduce those hazards and implement plans to reduce your risk. And if your task at your company requires you to wear a respirator 30 or more days per year, your company is required to offer free chest x-ray and lung function tests every three years. What you've learned here today is by no means entirely comprehensive of the ruling, but it is meant to give you a basic understanding of why the standard was developed, and at the very least, what your company should be doing. You always want to refer to the latest publications of the standard. To read more about this subject and to stay up to date on changes, please visit the OSHA website for more information. Any PPE that may be required to protect you for silica exposure is above and beyond PPE that may be required for you to wear day to day on the job.